The title of the message is Believe It or Not. Um, I'm going to start out with uh, a Bible verse, John 8.24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. If you don't believe that I am, you will die in your sins. A couple of weeks ago, a few of us were talking in the back, um, and the subject of hell came up. Angie viewed a teaching on David Reagan's website where David taught that hell is limited to the degree of sins in one's life. You are judged according to the sins committed in your life. Once the punishment is served, you would cease to exist and suffering would be over. Or at least that's my understanding of what he was teaching. I also checked out the video myself. I was prompted to check out the Bible and to see what our Lord has to say about or on the subject of hell. I would like to share some verses that got my attention. Jesus is speaking to us from the book of Matthew, Matthew 5, verse 22. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But, ever, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. And then Matthew 18 verses 6 through 14. Whoever causes one of my little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offenses come. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maim rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. As we read that next verse, take note of the emphasis Jesus places on the lost. Verse 10 of Matthew 18. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven... Their angels all, always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is straying? And if he should find it, Assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. You know, I always think about the, that particular verse about leaving the ninety-nine sheep and seeking out the one that is lost. You know, all of us as sinners at one point of our life before Jesus came into our hearts, we were lost. And even in the time of our life, whether we realized it or not, God was working all of the events in our life to bring ourselves to him, to that one crucial moment where we make the most important decision to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And, you know, if 
one of the most wonderful things we get to pray and intercede for those that be it our friends family co-workers people we come into contact with we get to pray for them and we can intercede in prayer to the lord for their hearts that they would one day be open and receive the lord for themselves and it's exciting as a believer to be a part of that to me i the intercessory prayer you know you hear about it but when you apply it personally to your life and begin to practice that it really takes on a whole new meaning and that's one of the privileges our dear lord gave us by opening that gap between him and us you know when he died on the cross in the book it tells us that the curtain was ripped from top to bottom and we get to come into his presence and that is so awesome i just I, it, it just it grabs my heart when i can pray any place any time i can go before the throne and he's right there the Holy Spirit is awesome. The Word of God is powerful. As I said before, these verses got my attention, and they spoke on such a personal level. God's Word goes right to the heart. Brian Norton always tells us in men's group, you don't read the Bible, it reads you. Jesus talked of hellfire quite often. He also told us, of the way out. He is that way. In Matthew 23, Jesus is lamba lambasting the scribes and Pharisees. The leaders of the church were not exempt from his many mornings, as we find in Matthew 23, verse 33. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell. God's judgment applies to everyone. No one is exempt. Jesus came first as Savior. He will come again as judge. You know, a couple of Sundays ago, Pastor Joel shared that story about the fellow that saved the little boy. And later on, as that little boy grew up to be an adult, he was uh, convicted of a crime and he was facing a the very same person that saved him as a kid. And uh, he was now the judge. And I, I always, that story kind of grabbed my heart that day. And that is so true about our Lord. And the judge told him, I came as your savior at that time. Now I'm your judge. So that really opened my eyes to that. Um, in Matthew 13, verses 38 through 42, Jesus talks of the great harvest at the end of the age. He explains to the disciples the meaning of the parable of the sower of the seed. He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. I want to share some scripture tonight to let the Lord do the talking. As I search the Gospels, Jesus warns us many times of the hellfire. He goes to high measures. In Mark, Chapter 9, verses 42 through 48. But whoever causes one of my little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. 
If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm does not die. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that is never quenched, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The phrase, worm does not die and fire is never quenched, is told from our Lord three times. He quotes from Isaiah 66, verse 24. They shall go forth and look upon the corpses of men who have transgressed against me, for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. Jesus is driving home the point. Fire never dies and is not quenched. Or I'm sorry, the worm never dies and the fire's not quenched. Excuse me. <laughs> we in our flesh are totally incapable to save ourselves. We, without Christ, are destined for hell. Jesus came to deliver us from hell. He, who is God incarnate, took our punishment and paid in full by his precious blood on the cross. If hell is rated only to the level of sin in one's life, why did he have to come himself and die a horrible death on a cross? Only he could intercede on our behalf. Based on that in itself would make me question a limited hell doctrine. There's so much deception out there. How can we find the truth? We go right to the Lord. We go to his word. Jesus is the same as he was yesterday and tomorrow. He holds his word above his name. Taken from Psalm 138 verse 2. Today we live in a world where there are so many ideas, so many views which change according to the mood. I'm so thankful that Jesus is the rock we can stand on. His word will never pass away. Remember, as we talk of all these verses on hell, it doesn't end there. Everyone is offered a way out. Jesus is the good news. He came to seek and save what is lost. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, Jesus tells us of a man in torment. Take note of the detail of the description of his, of his condition and his experience there. We'll pick up at verse 19 of Luke 16. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was, the beggar died and was carried to the angel, by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus 
that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of tor torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And see, uh, he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through the one rise from the dead. Reading this makes me ponder eternity without Christ. This is what a person will face, suffering day and night without a break. Again, again, the question is asked, why, if hell does exist on a limited basis, would Jesus go through such detail and often of this eternal suffrage? As I asked before, why did he take the punishment upon himself? Ponder this, he being God came down, became flesh, and gave himself for us. His blood was the only price paid that was accepted for our sin. Praise God. Thank you, dear Jesus. What a cost you can't imagine. Glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is an eternity for all, whether we believe it or not. You don't just live and die. There is a day of reckoning. Here's some scripture on this. Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, tell us of the last days and final judgment. In Daniel 12, verse 1, At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn away turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. Another scripture, Matthew twenty five, verses thirty one through forty six. Jesus is telling us of the last day's events. Matthew twenty five, verse thirty one. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom 
prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And the righteousness will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will answer, then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick in prison, you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, a stranger or a stranger or naked or sick in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And they will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Please understand that there is a lot of scripture presented here so that this eternal point is being made. There is a final judgment with eternal consequences. We are all accountable to God. Are we going to reckon on our own or accept God's provision through Jesus Christ our Lord? God God's only acceptable sacrifice. The devil would love nothing more than to say, it isn't real. It is all a fairy tale. There is no heaven and hell. You're safe. You're making a whole lot out of nothing. Even if there was, you're all good people. Your good works are sufficient. Jesus was just a good teacher. He's just another guy with his own ideas. Truth is relative, and it doesn't matter anyway. Maybe Jesus didn't exist at all. Besides, you all came from a toad anyway, so what's the big deal? Relax. You have nothing but time. Live it up. You only live once, then you die. That's it. Really? My question is, are you willing to bet your eternity on all that? We all know better. The sad part is, this stuff is out there. On October 13, 1964, Paul Harvey made a broadcast. If I were the devil, this is what I would do. Look it up. You would be amazed of the accuracy from then to now. It's almost prophetic. Please do not be deceived. Don't fall for the lie of the devil. There is a day of reckoning. We all have to give an account. I, I drive the point home, you know, we as believers, we have security in Christ. You know, I always have these thoughts you know, being, uh, I struggled with insecurity at one point in my life and when I came to know the Lord, he laid the new foundations of the house, solid rock that I could stand on, and he was never going to leave me, forsake me. And when I get these points of insecurity or weaknesses, 
this thought hits, hits me. Fear not, my child, I go before you always. And I take comfort in knowing that. And I know all you share that who love the Lord. Um, but we look at the lost in a whole different light. You know, when you're sitting at the table with family, and I can remember this holiday, the Easter holiday, I'm sitting at the table with my family, and this thought hit me. Without Jesus, we're destined for hell. They don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's the outcome. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one come unto the Father except through him. It's an invitation for all. Nobody goes to hell. God doesn't put them there. They choose to go there. Jesus offers the invitation daily. You know, we're left here as a ransom to the lost. We get to share with them and tell them about Jesus. And I know many times I've allowed fear to get in the way and I, ooh, I don't know what they're going to think of me. And forgive me, dear Jesus, for ever thinking that. He gave his precious blood for us. How could we not talk about him? I think of Matthew uh, 10, 28. And I'll probably butcher the quote, but he says, Fear not the one that can only kill the body, but fear the one that can kill both the body and soul in hell. You know, the verse just hit me. If you're ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before the Father. And I say, oh, Lord Jesus, forgive me. You know, sometimes I, I love uh, going through the Word of God because if I don't use it daily, it's gone. I don't know if I could ever go back to some of the math courses I've taken because I don't practice math every day. I don't remember some of the basic stuff. And, but we have the Word of God, and it's so nice that we can go there every day and read and reread. If we don't quite get it, Lord, give us the wisdom and read it again and read it again. Sometimes I'll read a passage about three, four times, and before I know it, 45 minutes has gone by. And, but that is a gift. The Word of God is God's love letter to us. He loves us so dearly. He's given us the instruction manual. You know, in it we find salvation. In it we find a, how to live. And He tells us how to live to protect us. You know, I just, again, I just cannot think, you know, as I've did all these study on this and reading all these verses about hell, Lord saying, Conrad, how much more do I have to drive home the point? Tell them of my love. Tell them I love them. I died for them. That's the good news. Let's take a look at Revelation uh, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. These verses tell us more of the great white throne judgment. We'll pick up at Revelation 20, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. You know, the, the question is, you know, for those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, are you willing to gamble on your good deeds because when we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, 
there is much rejoicing in heaven. You know that scripture we read before about the Lord leaving the 99 sheep and getting that one and the rejoicing over that one sheep that repents. The, there's a party and the angels are dancing when a soul gives their life to Jesus and is redeemed. Their name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. That's our hope eternal. We know this world is passing away. We see it on the news. We see the foolishness that's going on. Man in their own wisdom thinks they're smarter than God and can pass laws contrary to what, our, what the Word of God teaches. They think they can do it better. Read your history books. Man cannot do it better. This Word is tried and true. You know, and we'll stand on it to the day we die. Peter says, Lord, where, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. I've been down this road too far. I don't want to go back to the world. And I know none of you do either. Stand on the word of God. We're washed and cleaned by the blood of the Lamb. He, you know, he doesn't see the sins anymore. He says, it's paid. It's separated from them. Far as the east is to the west, sunk to the depths of the sea. The good news is Jesus loves us and saves us. The old familiar verses, John chapter 3, 13 through 7. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds shall be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. I can add no more to the word of God. Jesus says it all. With all this talk of hell and judgment, I felt it would be good to read these verses. Many people want to deny the truth. They want to justify what they believe and do. I share this because I did this. You can live in your own reality, but that doesn't change the facts. There's none good, no, not one. Romans 3.12 All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Romans 6.23 Every person has a free will. A decision faces us all. We have the window of our life to make it. Is Jesus Lord and Savior? Have we sold out all for him? Does he have total control of every area of our life? I have been asking myself these questions. And when faced with different circumstances and trials that come up in my life, at a heart level, I don't like the answer. Then that is time for confession and repentance. 
I'm thankful for Christ, who is our mediator and great high priest. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 28 tell us, For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as high priest, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundations of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice himself. And it is appointed for men to die once, but after that, the judgment. So Christ is offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin for salvation. In John 3.36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. We as believers need to be in the word of God to be ready to testify for the truth, not only for our benefit, but for the dear ones that come across, across our path. I speak for myself as I prepare and, and teach, I find that I am the biggest student here. My prayer is that the Holy Spirit, Spirit teaches us all here, on the radio and on the internet. All glory, all to the glory of Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord. I know as I read these passages on hellfire, my heart grows more and more burdened for the lost. Those who don't know Jesus or have rejected him as their personal Lord and Savior. Hell was a designed originally for Satan and his demons. Can you imagine the level of torment that awaits those without Christ? Matthew 25, 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever. We have already read the following verses which tell us that those whose names are not written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20:15 just because many ref many people refuse to believe the existence of hell does not change the fact that it does indeed exist according to God's holy word. I think about the 20 acres of woods my wife and I own up north. We walk through and many trees are blown over. Whether I'm there to hear the noise of them falling or not does not change the fact they make a noise a tree makes a noise every time it falls facts are facts whether we believe it or not we as believers get to intercede in prayer for those who haven't accepted Jesus we pray that the Lord will open their minds and hearts give them wisdom and understanding of himself and on one glorious day, they too will receive him as their own personal Lord and Savior, to live eternally with him as well. You know, I'm repeating this a lot. You know, the Lord repeats things in the Bible many times because it's a very important, crucial point. Our Lord 
came to seek and save what is lost. And it's so good that we can be reminded of that every day. There are three terrifying facts of hell for the lost. Matthew 13, verse 50, furnace of fire, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Mark 9, 48, where the worm does not die and fire is not quenched. Revelation 14, 10, he will be tormented with fire and brimstone. Hell is conscious torment. Hell is eternal and irreversible. Revelation 14.11, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. A question many would ask in light of all this talk of hell, how can a loving God send people to a horrible hell? Let us take a look at some scripture that deals with this. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 through 32. You know, that chapter gives you such a wonderful description of man's condition. And I, it was always, as I read that, it gave me answers as to why things are the way they are. Let's just pick up with Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, first the Jew and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. In their foolish, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God into image made like corruptible man, and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their woman exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to debase mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, 
haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same but also approve of those who practice them. You know, that's, I guess, at one point or all, I know I, that last verse just got my heart. You know, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. You think about things that go on around us. And the Holy Spirit says, you got to say something about this. This isn't right. And I know many times, God forgive me, I've, I mean, I've remained silent. I said, Lord, forgive me for being fearful. And that old Matthew 10, 28 comes up again. And I thank, I thank the Lord for his great mercy for second chance. And I know I've been really trying to be more and more vocal about my faith at work because I shared with the fellas that I struggle in, at work I grew up with these boys. I love them dearly. And uh, it was B.C. before Christ. And, and boy, I'll tell you, it's, that's, you know, when the Lord says that in his own hometown is a prophet without honor, he wasn't kidding. I really, he's telling me, Conrad, this is where the rubber meets the road. You know, what we do in the quiet or in the, in the lone or under a strife or hardship shows what we're really made of. It's a litmus test of our faith. Do you believe in me or not? And oh, as believers, we, 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 the Lord's calling us. Where are you in this area in your life? Are you on the fence? Are you 100% sold out for me? Because if you're lukewarm, he'll spew you out of his mouth. Oh, it's not a good comparison. So I, you know, when I, you know, we get to close things in prayer, and I know when I sit in the shop and I, I've been listening to our radio station in the morning. I get there a few minutes early, and I say, Lord, just, I know, forgive me for failing in this place. Forgive me for laughing at things that are inappropriate. Help me, dear Jesus, to live for you. That we get to do that as believers because this is a... He's not leaving us as orphans. He comes to our aid in his strength and his, in his spirit. We can live for him and stand for him. Let's take a look at Hebrews... Uh, Chapter 4, verse 13. You know, Joe's been in the book of Hebrews, and I was kind of excited. I, he's going into Hebrews because that, that one is a good book. There's so much in there. And we a few weeks back, we just went through Hebrews chapter 4. But anyway, let's pick up with verse 13. You know, God sees all things. And there is no cre creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He sees all, even in the quiet places, and in the, in the, in the, he sees us wherever we are. We're not getting away with anything. He sees us open and uh, bare, come clean, come clean, confess it to him. You know, unconfessed sin holds us back. I was listening to a preacher on the radio, and he was saying, you know, the, the stream of blessings the Lord wants to give us, but the sin that we hold, he sees it anyway. Just give it to him. Father, forgive me. You know, and we always have that gesture 
okay, you're done. <laughs> you know, okay. He sees us as we are at our dirtiest. Joy says, you know, I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy. Yeah, you're right, you are. But it's through him that we live and breathe and have our being. It's in him we, we move and we live. I, you know, I live because he gave himself for me. That's just the best awesome news, the hope that we can stand on. Romans uh, chapter 2, verse 11. For there is no partiality with God. You know, God doesn't have favors. There's a measure of law that we are all judged, a mark in which we are measured. In our own flesh, we will never reach it, no matter how hard we try. Our Lord knows this. We are without re out remedy on our own. God sent his son, Jesus. You know, we read in John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. He tells us of his great love. He gave his only begotten son. Second Colossians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. For the love of Christ compels us uh, because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God, who was in Christ, reconcile, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 5, and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying all ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us for, from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And then Second Peter uh, verses 9 
through the first half of verse 15. You know, it's wonderful as you look at all these scripture and this Bible was written by the hand of God because all these different authors of these books and they're saying, it knits it all together in one message. You can take a normal book, say you pull a book off the library and if you were to go from chapter 1 to chapter 15 over to chapter 10 back to chapter 20 or whatever is in that book, you'd be goofed up, you'd be confused. But in the Bible, the Holy Spirit can run you through the book through all the, and he'll communicate a message to you that only he can. Well, let's take a look at Second Peter verses 9. The Lord is not slack. I'm sorry. Uh, oh boy, that's a good one. <laughs> huh? yeah. Chapter, chapter three, verse nine. Thank you. You know, your hands aren't as fast as your brain, so you're missing a few things when you type. Okay. Second Peter, verse uh, nine, chapter three. The Lord is not slack. Concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But on the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hastening and coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the element elements melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be, gil be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, and consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. These are few passages which demonstrate our Lord's love for us and our response to him as his followers. As a follower of the Lord, we are commanded to go out and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the world. I love uh, verse 9. Not willing that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God will seek those who seek him. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. Taken from Luke 19, verse 10. We all have a free will. We do have a choice. So we have to respond. Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receive. And he who seeks, find. And to him who knocks, it will be open. Or what man is there among you, if his son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? How much fairer can it be 
Again, God doesn't send every, anybody to hell. You choose to go. There's a fork in the road. One side, God's plan of salvation, Jesus, where you'll find peace, love, joy, healing, strength, and direction. He is with you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Or face life alone and die in your sin and face eternal punishment. The very first statement of this message was John chapter 8, verse 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins if you don't believe that I am. You will die in your sins. Things are the way they are. People can receive it or reject it. Consequences are there for all decisions made. That's a fact. Believe it or not. You know, if, you know like Steve, we, time gets away from us. I have a few more pages, but I, I would like to leave you with um, just a couple more verses taken from Hebrews uh, 10, verses 26 through 31. These are verses that just got my heart. I remember the night many years ago when I read them. And, you know, there's there, uh, there are verses with, you know, if you reject Christ, it just makes it clear. Let's pick up with Hebrews 10, verse 26. It tells us of a willful rejection of Christ's provision. For if we sin willingly after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour all the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we who knew him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Taken from Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Deuteronomy 32, 36. In verse 31 of Hebrews 10, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Folks, we don't know how much time we have left. For those here listening on the radio or on the internet, if you don't know Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior and feeling the Lord tugging at your heart now, please, please do not delay and put it off. Respond now. You're not guaranteed your next breath. When you die, it's too late. Hebrews 9.27 tells us, um, I'm just going to re-look that up. But anyway, it is appointed to die once and then the judgment. Pray now to Jesus. Ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to come into your life to guide and lead you here on out. He bought and paid the price of your salvation by his own precious blood. Give him lordship over your life. Begin to enjoy the wonderful journey and plan he has for you. He loves you dearly. It will not be all rosy. Hardship will remain, but you won't have to face life alone. He is with you. 
He will not leave you or forsake you. Joshua 1, 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. For those of us who have already accepted Jesus, pray for opportunities to share Jesus with others. Be ready in season and out of season to testify for the hope that is in you. We need to stand strong. The devil's days are numbered. Time is, times are going to get tougher. But Isaiah 41.10 tells us, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Our God is faithful. We have his word to fall back on. We have a firm foundation tried and true through the ages. We get to pray, to intercede for others, present all things to the throne of God, and he will answer according to his perfect will. Rest in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank and praise you for this time, this hour that we get to be here, to be in your word. Father, a lot of scripture has passed over tonight. Father, I pray that it, it just is written in our hearts and it takes root. Father, I thank you for the folks here, for on the radio and on the internet. Help us, Lord, to take what is said here Take it to heart to help change our lives, to live for you. You are our Lord and Savior and Master and Redeemer and King. Our hope is in you. Walk with us, Lord, each day. Lead us, O Lord, in our lives. Guide us in our ways. Show us your way, O God. We hunger and thirst for you. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.